Hello everyone, welcome back to Nerve after our winter slash summer break. It's nice to have all of you online again. Um, yeah, so for those of you joining us for the first time, we are the Neural Engineering Research Venture and our aim is to bring neuroscience to life in Africa and around the world. And I'm Julianne, Siobhan and I will be your hosts for the evening and you can look out for Dobby in the comments section. So our speaker today will be speaking about a topic that's very close to my heart, which is literature. But before we jump into that, we do have a couple of announcements that I'd like to share with you guys. So um, first off here, sorry, let me just find my, my place over here. So we have the Deep Learning in Darbar Mentorship that aims to strengthen the African machine learning community by the development of fundamental skills. The program matches members of the African AI community with mentors for short-term personalized interactions across a wide, wide range of topic areas. You are all encouraged to either join the excellent global network of mentors, or if you identify as part of the African machine learning community, please do sign up as a mentee. Computational neuroscience is included in the scope of these sessions, and Siobhan will be sharing all of these links for you in the comments. Then there's also the first Applied Machine Learning Days in Africa that starts on the 2nd of September. This will include three days of talks, tutorials, and workshops on machine learning and artificial intelligence with top speakers from industry and academia. The Applied Machine Learning Days in Africa is focused on the application of machine learning and artificial intelligence for innovation and sustainable de sustainable development in African countries, making it a particularly popular event for academia, industry, and businesses. The event will be completely virtual and will be presented in English. And there's also the Indaba X 2021, which will be held in the form of a roadshow. The roadshow will take place from the 3rd of September to the 27th of November and will offer a series of events. Each event will be hosted by a different team of local organizers or institutions, and there will be all sorts of events, competitions, and at least one hackathon. There's a community Discord forum, so be sure to take a look at the website for more information. Then the SU Launch Lab, together with some industry partners, are hosting their annual hackathon. The event will take place from the 15th to the 17th of October and is exclusive to Stellenbosch University students. So if we do have some audience members who are Stellenbosch University students, be sure to check that out. There will be two challenges to choose from. The first will be a FinTech challenge, and the second, a data science challenge, will focus on using algorithms to identify clusters, topologies, and other features of an AWS Neptune graph database. There's also prize money to be won for this. Applications are currently open and will close on Monday, September 20th. So yes, Siobhan will share all of these links with you guys. Just a couple of house rules before we get started. Please do use respectful and inclusive language on our platform. And there's also the ask a question feature. So remember to post your questions here during the presentation. Tonight's event will be slightly different from our usual structure. So we encourage all of you to post your questions as they arrive. We won't have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, but rather throughout the entire talk. So yeah, vote for your favorite questions, post your questions. And then um, if you don't have a mic or you don't wanna come on screen to ask your question, just add please ask and we will ask on your behalf. If not, we will assume that you will be coming on screen to ask your questions. And lastly, if your connection is slow, try to refresh your browser. Alternatively, you can select the compatibility mode from the audio visual help button and choose your settings there. Otherwise, if your connection fails completely, the talk will be available to stream after the event. I will now hand over to Siobhan. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to start off by introducing our special event. We are belatedly celebrating World Elephant Day, a day which serves to raise awareness for the plights of these beneficent creatures. While they garner respect from most cultures and nations, both the Asian and African elephants are on the brink of distinction. We need to work together to raise awareness to protect the world's elephants. It also gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Angus Fletcher, a professor of story science at Ohio State's Project, Project Narrative. Angus has contributed to the Developmental Artificial Intelligence Program for DARPA with Eric Larson, Todd Hughes, and the US Army. For those that aren't aware, the prestigious DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, has held to a singular and enduring mission to make pivotal investments in breakthrough technologies, a mission upon which they continue to deliver. Angus has also, also recently written two books. The first book, Wonderworks, came out earlier this year in 2021, and the second, Story Thinking, will be available in 2022. 
Thank you very much for joining us this evening. And just a reminder to the audience to please get your questions in during the event. We'd love to have you join us on screen as well, so don't be shy. Hi, well, thank you for that introduction and uh, thank you for uh, coming to listen to me. Uh, as you have heard, I'm gonna be giving a slightly non-traditional talk um, due to the fact that I've literally just come back from uh, being tapped by the US Army to go work with them on a project. So I just got back to my house this morning and a little jet lagged and sleep deprived. So I did not have time to prepare a full talk. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk briefly about my background and experience working with AI, specifically around creativity um, and why it is that AI cannot, and in my view is never ever going to be creative in the way that human brains are, um, drawing on my own background both in neuroscience and also just working in general in creativity. Um, and what I'm gonna do is try and make the talk accessible by first of all, just talking just a little bit about my history of working with AI. And then I'll go into the logical proof of why it is that computers can't create like humans. And I wanna say at the top of the talk, my purpose here is not to bash computers or to say that AI is a terrible waste of time. I don't believe that at all. Really, what I believe is that AI is an incredibly powerful tool, but its intelligence is different from human intelligence. It has just different strengths. It does different things. And the future of intelligence, as far as we can understand it now, lies in a cooperative relationship between human and artificial intelligence uh, because we can each do things that the other can't. So that's the main purpose here is to, is to say, AI is never going to replace humans. AI is never going to take over the world. AI is never going to go Skynet and kind of plot a utopian future. None of those things are going to happen. Um, but together with AI, we can solve lots of problems that affect us all. As long as we kind of realize what AI can do and are honest about what it can't do and shift the burden onto ourselves and accept responsibility for solving some of our own problems, um, of which honestly, the way they do that is probably to improve our schools. Um, as opposed to keep investing all this money in AI. So anyway, that's just the kind of top line of, of where I'm going to go. Um, so before I go into the proof, I do want to stress that I did not start out to write a proof about computers. I just was hired on a bunch of AI projects because of my expertise. And my assumption was when I accepted working on those AI projects, that the projects were going to work. I mean, um, you'd have to be a pretty bad person to accept lots of money to work on a project that you knew was doomed at the beginning. That would be a highly irresponsible thing to do. Um, so uh, I got asked by a bunch of companies to help them with problems, essentially um, problems involving making AI more intelligent, making it more creative, enabling it to solve problems on its own that humans can solve easily, even children can solve, but AI can't. And because of my expertise in creativity and other areas, I was brought on to, to to consult and what ended up happening is we just kept running again and again and again and again into the same wall. Um, and the guys who were sort of running the projects, often many of them who were not actually programmers themselves, but were philosophers or business folk or whatever, um, just kept yelling at the programmers to kind of find ways to solve these problems. And the programmers could never find any ways to solve the problems. And so I sort of started to learn myself how programming worked and started to realize that the programmers could not solve the problems because they were unsolvable problems. And we were asking the machines to do something that the machines couldn't do. As far as the specific projects that I've worked on or am working on, just to give you a sense, they range from everything from very cutting edge NLPs, natural language processors. So just kind of, you know, um, reading books or news articles and, and, and then saying what they mean, or even generating books and news articles, you know, as a sort of uh, uh, attempt to replace human authors. So that's kind of one extreme. And then the other extreme, there's the use of AI. Um, I can't go too much in detail about this uh, because it, it does involve the military, but there's the use of AI essentially to replace or assist uh, humans in terms of decision-making. And you know, what would happen, you know, I mean, to take a, a simple obvious example, could an AI fly a plane better than a human? Uh, could, an, could an AI uh, run a company better than a human? Could an AI be a doctor better than a human? You know, could you have AI in all these kinds of positions? Because wouldn't that be wonderful if we could uh, replace all these useless humans, you know, with AI, and then, you know, the rest of us humans should just go out and have lunch and things. So, so I've kind of worked the gambit from natural language processing to actually what you might consider decision-making or even like flat out human replacement uh, in terms of leadership or something like that. And um, all these projects have, have, have catastrophically failed and they've all failed for exactly, exactly the same reason. 
So before getting into that reason, um, let me just start with some obvious points about the ways that humans and AI think differently that I think will be non-controversial because we all know, I mean, anyone who's used uh, uh, a machine learning application or any kind of AI just knows that machines operate differently than humans, for better or for worse. Um, the most obvious difference is that AI is very, very data heavy. And another way of saying that is AI is essentially a statistics machine. It takes huge amounts of data and it looks for trends. It looks for correlations. Uh, it looks for um, algorithms that can be repeated. The human brain, as you will notice, if you've encountered any humans recently, um, does not operate like that. Humans are not able to take on huge amounts of information and analyze it statistically. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, human brains generally fixate on a few pieces of information and then basically interpret everything through those pieces of information. Uh, so, you know, you'll just say, oh, this is important. And then anything else that comes into your view, you'll say, oh, that's not important. Or you'll use some kind of confirmation bias or whatever to bend that, that other piece of evidence into confirmation with the evidence that you have and so on and so forth. So humans are very data light. AI is very data heavy. Now, most of the time when people make that distinction, it's used to bash human intelligence. Oh, humans are so dumb. You can't handle lots of data. Uh, you're biased, you're warped, you know, you fixate on things. And, and, the, and the typical thing that people say about humans is, is you bend facts to fit your pre-existing narrative. Whereas computers are able to take on any number of facts and then constantly flex and adapt. Humans are constantly uh, bending or cherry picking or doing whatever the facts to, 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 to fit with what it is we want to believe. And that's true. That's one reason why AI in many domains is more effective and more intelligent than humans. Any domain where there's a lot of stable data, where things are not changing over time and data is, 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 is reliable and, and plentiful, computers win. So in certain kinds of logistics chains, for example, computers are always gonna be humans, um, or chess, any board game, because the rules never change in chess, you know, the data is always valid. A, a chess game that was played a thousand years ago, the data from that uh, chess game is still valid today. So any domains like that, where you can get a lot of data and the data is stable and consistent, uh, computers are always gonna crush humans. Uh, sorry, could I maybe just ask a quick question? Yeah. Oh, maybe um, just counter something. So I, I'm curious, so start off by saying that AI is never gonna achieve all of this, so, um, but, you're also currently describing AI as it is today, which I completely agree with. But I wonder if the argument can't be made that we're maybe just in a like a rut. Like as humans, we're not thinking differently and we just kind of keep trying to over-optimize what we already have. And it, like, like, is it fair to put a ceiling on human intelligence right now? Especially when we start merging with machines like brain computer interfaces and things like that. I, I, yeah, I'm just, just curious to hear your take on that. Well, to be honest, I, I don't think humans are going to merge with machines in quite that way. We can talk about that. Um, but so the question I think you're asking is, well, if we humans were smarter, couldn't we figure out how to make the computers smarter? Like, like, how do we know that the computers don't have this capacity in them and we're just too dumb to get it out of them, basically? Something like that. And, you know, and, and the kind of classic example of this historically would be something like um, uh, uh, Bayesian statistics or something like that, where, you know, for a long time, people would say, oh, computers can only think in binary. They can't, you know, they can't think in shades of gray. And then all of a sudden, no, that's actually not true. They can, you know, we figured out a way to, 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 to. The answer is no, computers will never do it because there's a hardware limit to, to the way that humans work. They're, the human neuron is mechanically different from a logic gate. A logic gate is what, is what um, exists in the ALU, the, the computer brain basically. So everything that a computer thinks has to mechanically obey um, the function of the ALU. And the ALU is a transistor, it's an on-off thing. But the thing that's most important about it is that these logic gates are put together to perform the rules of Aristotelian logic, uh, which are and or not operations, or in actually most computers now, NAND nor, because it turns out that those two operations can replace those three. So basically computers can only do things that follow those two rules. Those two rules are the same rules of medieval science. In the Middle Ages, 
Aristotle's laws of logic were applied to nature. And what happened is nature broke those rules. And we're just doing the same thing now because there's a hardware limit. Human brains think differently. I'll get to that in a little bit, but the machinery of human brains are different. So the reason that the computers will never get there is not a software problem. It's a hardware problem. And the way to think about this is, um, you know, with your phone, you can download tons and tons of new software onto that phone, which can allow it to do tons and tons of amazing new things. But no matter what software you load onto your phone, it's never going to drive you to the supermarket. It just does not have the machinery in it. It doesn't have wheels, you know? Your phone is never gonna fly. And what happens a lot of times when we talk about AI, uh, when we talk about intelligence is we abstract it and we think it's not a mechanical process. So we just think it's this kind of hazy thing. And that's when people start talking about consciousness and all these other things. We can talk about consciousness at great length because consciousness is usually not what most people think that it is. Um, uh, consciousness is a little bit of a red herring. And even if computers became conscious, they would still not be able to do things that human brains can do um, because consciousness is only a tiny part of what human brains actually do. Uh, it's just awareness of the other parts. So in the same way that if a car became conscious, it wouldn't be able to fly, it would still be able to drive. A computer that became conscious would only ever be able to compute. So anyway, this is a long way of saying it's a hardware limit. It. It's, uh, it's not a failure of our ingenuity in the same way that if I gave you a fork and said, figure out how to make this fork uh, uh, travel in time. You know, like actually have this fork, not put it into a time machine, but make the fork itself a time machine. You could just spend infinity doing that and you couldn't do it because it's a different tool. A fork is for eating food. It's not for time. No. I, I think, yeah. I think oh, it's oh, actually, sorry. oh, sorry, Siobhan, do you want to, do you want to no. ask a question? Yeah, I just, I'm just, sorry. I, um, I'm just, I don't know anything about neuromorphic computing and quantum computing, but I wonder if Angus or anyone in the audience has like an idea of if that. I don't know, I'm just trying to think like how humans are thinking differently, but again, I can't really offer more than a question in that so sense. Quantum computing is another red herring. I talk about that a little bit in the pre-circulated article. Quantum computing is another way of doing and or not operations. It's a different machine for doing the same computations. So it's not, and you know, a lot of times when people start talking about quantum computing, they then go into this sort of mystical realm of, of indeterminacy. And then they say like the human brain is like a field of electrons and they start going on all these directions. That's just magical thinking. That's what happened in the middle ages. The human brain is a machine. We know how it works. It doesn't involve electron clouds in that particular way. Yes, there are electrons in the human brain, but actually what's interesting about the human brain is it's actually heavily non-electronic. Uh, human synapses are non-electronic, they're mechanical. Um, and so when you start applying electronic thinking and all these things, so. Quantum computing is not a game changer. All quantum computing means is that there are certain processes that are so data intensive that modern computers struggle to use them. And we see this with cryptocurrency or something like that. When people are mining, quote, quote unquote, mining, uh, what that means is that they're taking so much processing power. There's just burning, you know, you need all these computers. Whereas what uh, um, quantum computers can do is they can do it more efficiently, but it's still the same process. It's not a kind of magic answer. And again, I just have to say, so much of the talk that surrounds computers is, is semi-mystical nowadays. And that's why I keep comparing it to the Middle Ages, you know, is, is people just start talking about this stuff like it's magic. The whole point of technology is it's not magic. There's this I think this, this actually kind of ties in well with one of our audience members' questions. Um, you have to some extent, I think, answered it with the, the hardware um, statement. But Hope is asking, so are computers intelligent or is it rather that they are computationally, sorry, computationally extensive to go through all possible computations of a particular problem to get the optimal solution? And I guess that sort of ties into what you were saying just now as well. So I think what she's saying is, I might be, and you should check me on this. I think what she's saying is that computers brute force things. So computers basically, just when they're given a problem, they just compute all possibilities in a way that a human brain can't. So as a human brain, we have to be, quote, intelligent in the sense that we have to find an answer without brute force, you know? Um, so for example, when you ask me a question, I just can't give you 800,000 possible answers. Of which you, you know, I have to think to myself, which of these could be the correct answer, you know? And so to, yes, that extent, computers are dumb. Computers brute force almost everything. Um, they brute force it with data when they have it. And when they don't have data, they brute force it by kind of random generation of possibilities. Um, now, humans do something similar in the sense that we guess a lot, 
And, but, but it's different because we don't guess with that sheer quantity. The way that the human brain works is we guess and we see if it works. And if it does work, we keep doing it. And if it doesn't work, we try and adjust. And that's another way of saying that the brain uses the experimental scientific method as opposed to what people thought was the scientific method in the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, people thought the scientific method was induction. They thought that you inducted huge amounts of facts and abstracted those facts up to general truths. And in the 19th century, famously, John Herschel, um, a British astronomer, uh, proved that that was impossible. <laughs> That's not actually what the brain does is the brain guesses. And then once it guesses, it guesses, if my guess is correct, there will be this fact out there. Let me go look for it. And if I find that fact, then that confirms my guess. And so that's known as prediction and experiment as opposed to induction. And this is the beginning of the scientific revolution in the 19th century. This is how Sherlock Holmes operates, if you're interested. Um, Sherlock Holmes, even though you know he's always talking about you know how he deduced things and this, that, and the other thing, really he makes a guess and then he goes and looks for the evidence. If the evidence is there, as he predicted, correct. And that's how science still works today. New, uh, you know, Einstein made a guess. Um, he, did, he had almost no data whatsoever for relativity. He made a guess, and then in the 1919 editing experiment, it was confirmed. So that's the difference between human intelligence and computer intelligence, I think, to answer the question. is Computer intelligence, or whatever you want to call it, is brute force. Human intelligence is very much, I'm going to do one thing at a time and see if it works, and kind of react off that one thing. So it's maybe more elegant. Um, okay, so maybe continuing back to what I was saying before, and again, continue to interrupt if, if I'm going off tangents here, but, but when you work with an AI system, you discover very quickly that it's enormously fragile. And why is it so fragile? Well, it's fragile because the moment it encounters a volatile environment where the data changes rapidly or the data is changing so fast that it can't get very much data, the AI has no idea what to do because this is a statistical machine and it needs huge amounts of reliable data to make a decision. And if the data is unreliable or it's in small quantities or changing rapidly, the computer breaks immediately. It just can't function. Now, do humans break when there's very little data? Do we cease to function? No, we don't at all. We function fine. And the reason for that is because the human brain evolved in those environments. We involved in highly volatile environments where there was very little data and very little stability. So the human brain, I mean, depending on how you want to date it, it's at least a couple hundred thousand years old. It might be a little bit older than that. You know, most of its components are probably a million or so years old, you know, in, 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 in most of their kind of components. And, you know, back then, um, life could change on a dime. Um, there was, you know, not the availability or stability of information that we have now. And where in the modern world we've created very kind of stable landscapes where our lives are very predictable. I mean, you and I all know, or at least we like to pretend that we know, that we get up in the morning, uh, you know, our car is going to be there and the, and the road is going to be there and the mail is going to be delivered at a particular time and the supermarket is going to have oranges and all these kinds of things. So, you know, we've created this highly regimented environment. I mean, that's not the way that it was even a couple hundred years ago. I mean, there was constant famine, drought. I mean, you know, the amount of chaos um, that existed. And so the human brain had to survive in that environment. And it did through this method we've been talking about by making guesses, by, by having little data, but by guessing and predicting and following those predictions and seeing what worked. So it's just a completely different method of thinking. Um, now, because two things think differently, doesn't mean that they can't do the same tasks. You and I can think differently, but we can still accomplish the same task. We could go about doing the same task a different way. I mean, you and I could climb the same mountain up different paths, right? So in the case of humans and computers, a classic example is chess. Humans and computers play chess differently. Um, you know, computers calculate all possible board states and assign probabilities and this kind of stuff. And, you know, humans plan moves, you know, they guess, you know. Um, however, we can still both play the same game. So then the question becomes, why is it can't computers just do everything that humans can do but with their own different intelligence? Why couldn't you just get huge amounts of data and use that to do all the things that computers can do? Um, do we have a question before I go on or? Would you like to ask a question, sir? Or Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I did, but I, I thought, I, but you can finish your point, please. No, 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 I'm very boring. You're much more interested than me. You go ahead and interrupt and we'll, we'll, we'll respond <laughs> off what you said. 
Okay, thanks. Well, um, I'm boring sometimes, but then I, I have a tendency to tell really bad jokes, as uh, Siobhan <laughs> asked. Uh, I'm Mike Cohen. I'm uh, also a neuroscientist, and I, I've studied deep learning for like 20 years, basically, before it was uh, really deep. Um, so really, uh, thanks, Angus. It's a really nice discussion um, so far. I guess, you know, um, I, I like neuroscience, and I like um, deep learning and AI, but I get really annoyed when people <clears throat> claim that these deep learning networks are basically doing what brains do. And I get extremely annoyed when people call the nodes of these deep learning networks artificial neurons because they look absolutely nothing like, they don't behave anything like biological neurons. And in fairness, you know, it's true that like the McCulloch uh, model neuron from over a hundred years ago was kind of like what the deep learning nodes do now. But that was, you know, I mean, that that's, it feels very insulting to me because it's basically saying like a hundred years of biology you know, back when we didn't even have microscopes, really. And then, you know, that's sort of how we're interpreting these deep learning networks. So, but to me, this seems really um, crazy because, you know, so so we say like cars have horsepower, right? But nobody in their right mind says that, you know, this car is really great because it's just like a horse. You know, that's totally insane. And with planes, you know, no one says like, wow, airplanes are amazing because they're physiologically a model of a bird, you know? But cars and planes are amazing for the technology that they are. And it doesn't matter that they have zero link to actual physiology and biology. So I kind of feel like um, uh, progress in, in AI and deep learning is actually being slowed down because it's dragged because everyone wants it to be like a brain. Um, and, and I think if we can just abandon this concept and say, you know, it has nothing, it, you know, it's like a brain in the same way that a car is like a horse, you know, <laughs> then I think we could just make so much more progress in deep learning. So I was going to ask you if you agreed with that statement, but from your reaction, you clearly do. Yes. No, of course, things brilliant. Well, first of all, yes. I mean, I just think we have to stop thinking that humans are computers because we'll yeah. get smarter the more we treat ourselves as humans as opposed to computers. And computers will get smarter the more we treat computers as computers and not as yeah. human. And, you know, the DARPA stuff that I'm doing now is all, you know, I mean, on this thing. Actually, AI can get a lot smarter than it is now. AI can solve a lot more problems. Than this, but we just have to get over this absurd idea that somehow it's going to operate like a human. We have to identify the problems that it can solve that we can't yeah. and then upgrade it to solve those problems and then see it as a friend and, and a tool and an enabler. I mean, it just it's just as ridiculous as if, like, you know, like, you know, when you when you started a school, you tried to get every student to think exactly like you as opposed to thinking differently. Right. I mean, what a, yeah. what a silly school that would be if, if it's like, you know, if it's like biology is actually English, you know, is actually history. Like everything is the same. It's like, no, these are different ways of thinking. Um, let's nurture diversity. Let's embrace diversity. And let's get out of this weird idea that somehow everything has to be the same in order to be valuable. So you're preaching to the choir. I agree with you. Okay. Completely. And yeah. I just think in general, the more people understand both neuroscience and computers, the more people say they're both wonderful, but they're not the same thing. You know, right. yeah. a horse is not a car. I mean, a horse is great, you know, but there's not like a leg running around inside the engine. You know? exactly. There's a piston and the piston operates mechanically differently yeah. from, you know, a, a, a muscle. So, um, yeah. OK, so, so, you know, it's I'm glad you agree with me. It's almost unfortunate because, you know. When we disagree, you know, then we can have like a nice longer discussion. But I guess, do you have any ideas? Like I, I teach uh, about deep learning and this is, I always have a long lecture uh, about this, but you know, that, that reaches like, you know, some tens of people or whatever. Do you, do you have any idea, do you have any thoughts about how something like this can be brought into like societal consciousness that, you know, we don't need the two to be like each other? So I think, there's a couple things here. First of all, the reason that people don't like to hear this is because it's more complicated. Yeah. You know, it's also less fun. Uh, you know, I mean, people just really want this idea that somehow you can build like a computer that's like a human. I mean, that just sounds really fun, you know, and then they also want this idea that some, you know, so you're fighting this battle where you're trying to explain to people. So I really think the only way to win it, and this is why I'm doing the DARPA project, um, is to show that when you stop thinking like that, you actually do cooler stuff. 
And I think we have to actually beat Elon Musk and some of these guys who are constantly churning out <laughs> this propaganda. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm not even sure Elon Musk believes this propaganda. And I think that mainly the reason that people think Elon Musk is cool is because he builds rocket ships. I think we have to build something cooler than a rocket ship, which is what we can do. I mean, so I can tell you right now, um, what we're trying to do broad, I can't talk to specifics because it's a government program, but basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, if you can get humans and computers to work together more closely and harness their different intelligence, you can solve things and do things which no human and no computer can do. Right. Um, and what's happening now is computers are e humans are either deferring to computers. We're being like, oh, you know, everything or humans are ignoring computers. And if you can actually get them, I'm not talking about literally putting a computer in the human brain for reasons we can talk. I mean, that that is an engineering challenge, which is so beyond our current capabilities, you know, to like actually literally fuse a human brain with a computer. But you can build interfaces on computers that allow humans to act faster in response and also humans to challenge. And, you know, one of the things that humans are great at is adapting to change. And one of the things that computers are great at is accelerating. So you could think of it like if you think about a, um, like a track, humans are great on the curves, computers are great on the straightaways, you know? What if you can start to pair us together so that we're always handling the curves and they're always handling the straightaways? Well, we start to lap all the other cars, right, you know? So I think that's the answer. I don't think having a conversation with people, much as I would like to believe that our conversation would convince people in the audience, my guess is it's not because they're just coming up with a bunch of objections in their head. But what I think would happen is if you gave them a technology which was better than an iPhone, you know, and smarter than they were, and it wasn't a human or a computer, but it was us together, they would say, all right, it works. So that's, that's my goal is to build the machinery that's smarter as opposed to have too many conversations with people because, you know, Elon Musk is just more fun than I am. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the discussion. Thank you. Uh, this is so uh, maybe just to elaborate you, on the, the hardware aspect that you mentioned. Now, I know you can't go into specifics, so I'm rather going to um, because the one thing I do know about is neuro neuromorphic computing, which I think is one way people are trying to get out of the, the deep learning data crunch. Um, I, do you, is when you think about changing hardware, is that kind of the way you? you you, you, you mean to change or um, like is it, or should, we, should we be thinking differently when we think of hardware changes? So I sort of outlined this in one of my early articles. I mean, I basically say the only way we know for sure that you could have a hardware change in terms of building a machine that thinks like a human is to just model it on the human neuron. <laughs> and, you know, I, I'm not saying that, I mean, there are probably other ways to build machines that think like the human neuron, but, but the human neuron is mechanically very different. So as a starting point, a human neuron is not a continuous um, electronic device. I mean, this is one of the big differences. In a computer, you have a continuous flow of electronics. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an electronic device. And so what that means is that the computer at all times has to obey the laws of electronics or it'll explode. What that means is that a computer cannot improvise its own circuitry. So, you know, if you had a robot that could improvise its own circuitry, it could teach itself to act in all sorts of different ways and it could learn much more like a human. But the problem is the moment you started doing that, it would just explode because the moment it came up with a configuration that violated the laws of electronics, boom. Um, the human brain doesn't have to worry about that. Why? Because each of our neurons is internally powered. Instead of a continuous electron flow, we have a tiny little energy generator inside the neuron, our mitochondria. And our neurons are not connected by electronics, they're connected mechanically by synapse. And so what that means is that we can have the speed of electronic transmission in our brain, but also the flexibility of mechanical improvisation. So you would need to build a piece of hardware that could improvise like that without exploding. And a computer just can't do that. I mean, that's just not at all. And I mean, that's not a problem with the computer because the computer's not trying to do that, but, but it just could never do that. Um, so that's an example of what I'm talking about when I say you, it's a hardware problem. I'm saying it's not like, you know, we just need to add a couple extra transistors or build another logic gate or something. I'm saying the entire technology would need to be rethought. And that's not something at the moment that we have the technical capacity to do nor does there seem to be a lot of interest in that because that would require a huge amount of financial investments that would probably only pay off in a couple hundred years. 
Whereas what's happening now is people are like, let me make a lot of big promises about AI. And then you bring me in on a contract and then I get all this money, you know? And then when it doesn't work, I say, well, I probably just need a little more software. Give me another two years, give me some more money. That's just much more the way that these companies operate is, is, is just faster. Rather than if I say to you, give me hundreds of billions of dollars in 200 years and I'll solve your problem. Nobody wants to hear that. So I think that's why the hardware problem is, is, is a relative, the hardware solve is a long way off would be my guess. I, nothing that's on the horizon now is anywhere near uh, approximating what a human brain does. I mean, that's yeah, that's a really interesting thought. Like, I, I always thought human intelligence would be the limit, but I never considered human priorities could also limit us. Yeah, with what, like, you know, like what we want to solve now. Yeah, that's a really good point. Thanks. Um, and I, so I think we do have, actually, yeah, I think this ties in well with one of our other questions that we have, um, sort of coming back to the specific focus on creativity as well. Um, so Alex is asking, or he's saying, I guess one important difference is the ability for humans to imagine, um, like you also mentioned in your paper, or mentally invent things and solutions that we never actually encountered before. Yes. So do you think deep learning or machine learning models, or sorry, then he continues to say, deep learning and machine learning models are famously limited by the range of the data that it's being trained on. So do you think it's ever possible for a computer to imagine, which I guess sort of comes back to, to some of your other ideas? Well, so I would say broadly, no. I mean, computers cannot imagine. The problem with the term imagine is it's already tending us into mysticism. And so I want to be mechanically clear about what I mean by imagine. So I don't, I don't want to accuse people who like computers of being mystical and then be myself mystical about the human brain. But I mean, the, the main top line is no, um, machine learning and computers are never going to invent stuff in the way that humans do. And the, the reason for that is Computers can be creative, but to a computer being creative is mixing and matching from pre-existing sets. So, you know, you have all these different sets and the computer can randomly mix and match them. And so, for example, it, could, it can write, quote unquote, poetry by just randomly mixing and matching words together, you know, and then some of the words sound kind of interesting. Or it can create art, quote unquote, by mixing and matching pixels, you know, and then some of the pixels look kind of interesting, you know. So when we're talking about semiotics, semiotics is an extension of logic. And semiotics is a component of visual and linguistic art. It's not all of it, but it's a component of it. Computers can do that. Computers can be creative in those domains. Um, and in fact, they can be significantly more creative than humans uh, because they have far more variability and they have far, far, more, far more ability for that kind of divergent thought. Most of what humans invent, however, um, is not sort of, um, you know, uh, random pairings of words or, or pixels. Most of what humans invent our actions, our plans. So, you know, I mean, every, every new technology is a plan. I, you know, I'm building a tool to do this thing. Um, uh, in, since I've been spending so much time with the military recently, strategy and tactics, that's all planning. You know, every time we invent a plan to, 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 to kind of, you know, um, you know, achieve some aim, you know, strategically or tactically, that's a plan. Anytime as a, a, a government, you say, we're going to come up with these laws because we want to fix these problems in these ways. You know, we have a plan for how we're going to fix poverty or hunger or global warming. As a scientist, what you're doing when you invent an experiment is you're making a plan about what you're going to do. This is what I, so anytime you do any kind of action like that whatsoever, you invent that. Again, try to just be mechanical about it. A computer cannot do that because a computer cannot run narrative. Computers can only run semiotics. And again, this is the era of the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, everyone thought that nature was a, quote, book. You've ever heard this thing, the book of nature? And then people thought you would interpret the book of nature the way you would interpret language or words or something. Well, actually, we know now that nature is not a book. <laughs> it doesn't work at all like a book, at least not in that way, you know. Um, nature involves um, processes and powers and things that are non-semiotic, that are actions. So maybe I should talk now, I should maybe transition into the proof of why it is the computer's just you're not going to think like humans. So humans, uh, computers think in equations. Humans, uh, computers are mathematical and logical. That's why it's called the computer ALU, the arithmetic logic unit. And math and logic exists in the mathematical present tense, the eternal present tense. That's why it's always true. That's why two plus two always equals four. Two plus two isn't just going to equal four tomorrow or yesterday. It's always going to equal four. Why? Because it's in the eternal present tense. It's timeless. And that's why it's two plus two is four, to use a math example. 
or John is that man over there from, from logic, from syllogisms. It's always is, 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 is. So computers think in equations. Every algorithm is just an equation. An equation is another way of saying something equals another, which is another way of saying something is another, which is another way of saying we are in the present tense. So hopefully that all makes sense. Computers think in the present tense. Humans can think like that. Our visual cortex is a great example of a representational system. And parts of those neurons have migrated to other parts of our brains over evolution, which allows us to think in equations. I can think Bob is good, you know, or peace is nice. So I can do that, you know, that's something that I can do. But I can also think in actions. And an action does not take place entirely in the present tense. And the reason for that is an action always consists of at least two components, a cause and an effect. And a cause and its effect cannot exist at the same time, by definition. Nor can a cause exist without an effect or an effect without a cause. If I have a cause without an effect, it's not a cause, right? It's not causing anything because it doesn't have an effect. So in order to have uh, an action, a cause and effect, you need to have something in the present tense and then something else in the future. Or you need to have something in the present tense and something else in the past. You need to have two instants of time. Computers can only think in the present tense. So when you ask them to process an action, you give them something that does not compute. You're saying to them, I need you to consider two things that cannot exist, coexist, in terms of a cause and an effect. And I need you to consider them simultaneously, which is the only way you can think. So this breaks the computer. Computers cannot handle it. And this is a well-known problem in natural language processing. It's also a well-known problem in medieval science. And we know it's a problem because here's how they try and solve it. Classic example in language of an action is a verb. Angus runs, runs. Runs is the verb, it's the action. Now, if you say Angus runs to a computer, it just can't understand that. What you have to say to a computer is Angus is running. So you have to convert runs into an adjective. But what that does is that makes run, run, running, that makes runs into the same thing as blonde or white or you know any other characteristic that I have. And so it takes away the action part of the action. It removes it. So it's no longer thinking in action anymore. So this is another way of saying that the only way that computers can process verbs is by making them not into verbs, by making them into adjectives. The only way it can process actions is by making them not into actions. So this is this well-known problem why natural language processing doesn't work. And it's also why computers can't tell stories because they can't think in actions. They can't string actions together. Well, if you can't string actions together and you can't tell stories, guess what else you can't do? You can't make a plot. A plot is another word for a story. Another word for a plot is a plan. You can't make a plan. If you can't make a plan, you can't run a business. You can't run an army. You can't run a democracy. You can't even run your life because every morning you get up and make a plan for what you're gonna do that day, right? You know. Um, and the way that the human brain works, another, another more technical way of saying this is that Computers run something called correlational thought. An equation is a correlation. Uh, an action is a causation. Now, there's a tendency to behave as though one is better than the other in some circumstances. People often say, oh, causation is better than correlation. You know, you often get this. You, they, oh, that's just a correlation. That's not a causation. Neither is better than the other. They just have different functions. The important thing is that correlation can be very data heavy, which is what computers do. You can have a whole bunch of stuff correlated with data. Causation is data light, which is what humans do. Now, because causation is data light, that means a lot of the times it's wrong. <laughs> we as humans are constantly miscorrelating stuff. Um, this is where racism comes from. Racism is us saying that caused that and, and doing it completely incorrectly, you know, or anything else that humans do that's stupid is usually because we're jumping to a causation. So causation isn't necessarily right, but it is a different method of thinking. And so any creativity that involves action or causation is impossible for computers. Any uh, computer Sorry, just a point of clarification. So is the argument that computers cannot plan in the sense that humans, or like, because I, I remember you, earlier we were speaking about the guess and then we try to find the evidence for that and, mm -hmm. um, and then this causation and action, but 
I mean, my very basic understanding of the AlphaGo algorithms, they are in a sense doing some kind of planning. It's a very rudimentary, it's like basically a tree search and then they like run through simulations and then they assess the effects and then come back and then, you know, tweak it. So am I, am I linking two ideas or is the idea that humans can do this more, like in a much more sophisticated way and then computers are still just brute forcing it by running through these yeah. simulations? So when you're saying planning there, I understand that's really decision making as opposed to planning. You're saying, what's the optimal decision in this in this situation? Um, so, so another way to think about it would be this, uh, to cash it out. Um, if you give a computer 10 options, it can tell you which is the best option. You can say, based on the data, this is the best option. A human can come up with an 11th option. That's the planning. To plan is to innovate, to come up with a new option, to come up with a new action. So that's what I mean by plan. Um, what you're talking about is given a, a, a field of possibility, can I pick the best one? Now, a lot of times in business today, because business has become so obsessed with decision making and become so obsessed with data, planning has become, you know, merged into decision making, to your point, you know. So companies are often like, oh, we're planning when they're actually decision making. Um, and the problem with decision making is it's always um, retroactive. It's always based on the data you have up to now and the decisions you've made up to now. So it's inherently conservative. Whereas what humans can do is innovate. They can say, let's do something new that hasn't been done before. And I can just tell you, looking out in the world right now, that's what we need. Because most of what's happening is recycling the same things over and over and over again. And one of the reasons we keep recycling the same things over and over again is because we're all data addicted and no one wants to take a chance anymore. I mean, if you talk to politicians or any of these people, nobody wants to take a risk anymore. Everyone wants to know the facts before they make a decision. Well, if you need to know the facts before you make a decision, you're not making decisions, you know? Um, and the hard thing about life is to actually make the jump. Well, that can sound irresponsible, and certainly it is if you make the jump in an irresponsible way. But if you make the jump in the way that scientists make a jump, which is you say, I'm gonna make a prediction about what's gonna happen if I jump this way, and I'm gonna do it in a controlled space, and then I'm going to see if my jump doesn't produce the data that I think, you know, the, the feedback that I think, then I'm going to jump differently. Then all of a sudden it becomes okay, you know, and much safer. So 100% agree with what you're saying, but I'm just using plan in that different way. And I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I didn't quite make the distinction myself, so I'm glad you explained it. Thank you. Well, one thing I would say that's hard about this whole process is because we have gotten into this habit of talking about humans as though we're computers and computers as though they're humans, a lot of these words can kind of mean double things all the time. And so when we just talk about them globally, it seems like, oh, well, of course computers are doing that. When you get down to the nuts and bolts of it, computers are able to kind of randomly do this kind of creative thing of mashing stuff that's existed before. But what humans can do is humans can say, given this problem, let me reverse engineer backwards narratively to an original tool for solving that problem. So the way to think about this is that if you give a computer a toolbox, it can like mix and match all the different parts of those tools to come up with potentially new tools. So you come up with like a hammer saw, you know, um, you know, or like a chisel measuring tape or something like that. It could just kind of like put all these things together, you know. But if you were a human, you could say, I need to fly. How could I fly? And then you work backwards from wanting to fly to saying, what's a tool that could allow me to fly? And then you would say, a rocket ship. You know, and that's how you would, as a human, invent something, you know, um, and then you say, OK, well, how do I build a rocket ship? What do I need for a rocket ship? And so you're constantly doing this narrative thing of going forward and backwards, whereas computers just constantly just assembling and mixing, matching. Um, and the problem with that computer brute force mix and matching is even though it can be creative in a limited sense, the computers have no idea which is creative and which isn't. And so you have to just hit humans with like billions of random things that the computer came up with, you know? It's like computer poetry is like hundreds of thousands of just completely random things. And the poor human gets exhausted just trying to read them and figure out which is good. And so it's just faster and cheaper just to get a human to write a poem than it is to do a human, to get a computer to do it. So we, we have a question here from Hope um, saying that there's currently some work being done by IBM on logical neural networks where they are working towards explainable AI. So that's sort of being able to trace the path taken by a model from input to output, and then being able to in inspect and interpret every neuron in the system. Um, there's also a link there in the comments to the paper. So any views on your part on this explainable AI? 
So, you know, IBM is a really interesting case because, I mean, I think IBM's Watson is an example of both one of the most brilliant and one of the most stupidest <laughs> AI, you know, I mean, it's like, I mean, first of all, the engineers that were involved, I, I don't know if anyone saw Watson on Jeopardy. Um, I mean, in order to get Watson to compete on Jeopardy, extraordinary. And if we could go through all the sort of tiny little things that the engineers were able to solve, um, I mean, one of the things that I think is brilliant is they were able to get Watson to not buzz in. Think about that. You know, it wasn't just that the computer was identifying the best possible answer. It had to identify when it had low confidence in the best possible answer. And that's extraordinarily complicated. And the amount of stuff that went in. So I just think IBM as a whole is brilliant. I mean, their programs are brilliant. But you only have to look at things like IBM Health and what happened when Watson was put into hospitals to realize how really much IBM is part of the propaganda machine. And it's constantly taking small and fascinating and wonderful breakthroughs by its programmers and then using them to horrifically overpromise everything all the time as a way of kind of, you know. And so to the specific question, yes, I think that something is going on there. Uh, I, I agree with the, 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 the basic research there. No, I do not think that's going to fundamentally change the way that AI works. Um, I mean, you know, we want AI to become more, quote unquote, aware of what it's doing. I mean, just bracketing the question of consciousness for now. I mean, I think it's unlikely that computers will ever become conscious. Certainly the way that we're using them now, I think it's, it's, it's unlikely. If they were conscious, it wouldn't really change anything in the equation particularly, but using that language, it's important for AI to become more aware of what it's doing and be able to kind of track back because that is not only a way of learning, but also a way of alerting us humans that it's overmatched. Uh, and you know, you, you want, in the same way you want a human to be aware that they just messed up or that something went wrong so they can say, hey, you know. So another way of saying this is just because a computer is aware that it's making a mistake doesn't mean it can fix the mistake. And so, you know, learning involves both those components. And there's just a limit to how much computers can fix their own mistakes because they're operating in logic. And, you know, logic can do a lot of really wonderful things. Um, but again, all those things require either a timeless mathematical state of existence. So anything that exists outside of the real world in math, computers win. I mean, you know, um, or any part of the real world that starts to approximate math because there's so much data and so much regularity that it becomes a kind of almost mathematical pocket, um, then computers win. But computers just cannot change in any situation that's changing faster than they themselves, you know, can change. So that's where there's just always gonna be this hard limit, whereas as humans, we can. And we've gotten out of that habit of changing because we're gripped with a culture of fear and dependence. And our educational system has terrified us into thinking that there's right answers and wrong answers and standardized tests. And has forced us to operate more and more like computers. I mean, one of the reasons that we're experiencing so much emotional fragility and panic at the present is because we're all taught through um, our school systems. And I speak particularly for the United States. We have this system called the Common Core, which is basically entirely designed to um, encourage students to identify data and then make deductions and inductions from the data, like literally function like a computer. And that's how you're evaluated. And, you know, the great thing about standardized tests is that they can be graded by computers. So the whole system is so efficient. We teach humans to act like computers. We give them these tests to see whether or not they're acting like computers. Then we give the tests to the computers. The computers are like, yes, you're acting like me. And then everybody wins, except for the fact, no, because humans don't act like, don't want to act like computers. It drives us crazy. It causes emotional fragility. It doesn't allow us to develop our own innate strengths. So I just think that it's great to improve computers. And we want to do that at every step of the way because they're an important tool and can do wonderful things. But we don't want to get into this state of thinking that somehow they are going to be more than they are because really we have to start focusing on ourselves and our kids and our students and saying, how do we empower you and how do we break this tyranny of telling you that you're a computer and that life is logical? Life is not logical and you are not a computer, you know? Um, life is changing and volatile and you are an adaptive, resilient organism that is alive and can function in this changing space by yourself changing and growing. And computers cannot grow in that organic way. Um, you know, that's just not in the, the cards for them. Um, I really like that. I think that's a, a, an amazing compliment to the point you made earlier about um, human, or at least alluded to humans and 
and machines like almost working together, not as opposed to, yeah, so not, not becoming, not trying to make one the other, but kind of like creating this cohabitation, um, which is where the advancement is going to come from. Yeah, so we actually, yeah, so the points about schooling is so important, like, yeah, because at some points we need to keep these machines progressing and we only do that by educating ourselves. So, yeah, that's a really good point. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and also, I mean, this whole idea, I mean, I don't want to come off like a radical feminist here. But, you know, this whole idea that there's one right way of doing everything is the, is the bad inheritance of the Middle Ages and logic. Because what happened in the Middle Ages is, is, is you know, everyone was like, oh, the, the way to be intelligent is logic. There's one right way to do everything, you know. And then when you start focusing on one being the right way to do everything, you naturally then are like, okay, well, there's a man and a woman. Which one is the right way, right? And then you're like, oh, you know what? Woman is the less good version of man, right, you know. And then everything in the world becomes like this. This is where you get imperialism from. Imperialism is like, oh, there's these different countries, which is the one right country, which is the way, you know, and it's always this obsession with the one, the one, the one, the one, the one. Whereas if you say humans are great and computers are great, then you have two. And then the moment you have two, then you start to say, okay, different things have different functions. And then you're out of the Middle Ages and into biology. Because in biology, there is no one right way of doing things. If there was, there would be only one kind of tree in the forest. You would go outside and there would be the super tree. And that tree would do everything and it would be amazing, you know? And in the tree would be the super animal that did everything, it was amazing, you know? And instead you see an abundance of different animals and an abundance of different trees because everything in its own space has a different effectiveness and works differently. And our educational systems need to be more diverse in that way. They need to respect that humans are not just different from computers, but different from each other. Neurodiversity is real. Humans think differently from each other, you know? That's part of the reason that our species is a kind of wonderful, adaptable species, is, um, you know, creativity in the way that we do it um, is variant. We will come up with different ideas for poems. We will come up with different ideas for tools and different ideas for medicines. And that's a positive. And we don't want to keep creating these standardized schools where everyone is supposed to be doing the same thing all the time. We want to create schools that nurture and empower people to be different. And that to me is where feminism and Darwinism become the same thing because the whole point of both of them is there's not a right way of doing anything. You know, I mean, Darwin's great, I mean, Darwin is often, I think, mistaught as somehow being, you know, oh my God, Darwin killed God and there's no point anymore, you know, you know, or, you know, oh my God, eugenics or something like that. I mean, these are the two ways in which Darwinism is usually understood. And in reality, what Darwin is saying is there's no teleology to life. There's no right way to live. Life is branching and evolving and growing. And we can be scared of that because that means there's no final answers. You know, we can be scared of that because we say, oh, you know, you know, I want finality and absoluteness and totality. Or we can be excited by that and say, there's always room for growth. And I'm always going to meet someone who's different from me. And she's always going to teach me something that I didn't know because we're all different. And life is always going to be about change. And if you're a mystical person, which I am not, but if you were, you might say to yourself, well, if I was God and I was living in heaven and everything was the same all the time, I might create this world to be not like that as a chance to explore and grow. So, I mean, that's the wonderful thing about thinking about life as a space of growth is it's compatible with agnosticism and atheism and spiritualism because it matches all of their demands. So I just would want to encourage everyone to start thinking more about that way in which things are different and difference is good. And not everything has to be the same in order to be valuable. Humans have to be computers in order to be smart. Computers have to be humans in order to be smart. No, people can be smart in different ways. Machines can be smart in different ways. I mean, on a mechanical level, you don't want your toaster to do the same thing as your car. You're not like, oh my God, why don't I have a toaster car? That would be so much better. We've got to build the ultimate. No, you're like, no, I, I like the toaster because I like toast sometimes. I like the car because I like to drive sometimes, you know? Um, and it's again, it's that just sense every tool has a different purpose in this world, has a different strength, has a different weakness. The weakness of the toaster is it's not going to get you to work on time. The weakness of the car is it's never going to make toast. Um, but you know what? That's okay because when they come together, you get both movement and toast. So that's the top line that I really want to drive home here is that we have to be appropriately skeptical about computers and appropriately positive about ourselves, not to denigrate one and to uplift the other, but to achieve kind of our mutual potential.
Thanks. Uh, would you like us to th throw another question at you, or would you like you to continue with your talk? I don't have anything else to say. I mean, I, uh, I mean, I've now given you guys my entire. I mean, I don't know if everyone read the pre-circulated paper, but I mean, you know, they can go through that and see. I mean, if you want, I can talk about artificial general intelligence. I can talk about Turing. I can talk about all these topics uh, if people are interested in them. Um, I can talk um, about any of those things um, to kind of get into the details a little bit more, or I can I can go in another direction, whatever is, is the most appealing. I, yeah, I think the questions might be a good way to sort of guide the conversation. Yeah, um, Siobhan, do you want to ask? You can go ahead. Yeah. Um, so let let's go with the, the top voted question. Um, I, I can't see the name, um, but please comment in the chat so we can know who you are. Um, but the question is: In what direction is AI moving towards? the aspect of intu intuition. Um, so I guess the question, maybe to rephrase a bit, is yeah, like how are we moving towards intuition? Is it moving there at all? Intuition. OK, so intuition is another one of these murky words. Um, I mean, the idea of intuition emerged to explain the fact that our non-conscious brain is doing a lot more processing than our conscious brain. And this might just be a good time to point out that like we completely overvalue consciousness because it's all we're aware of as humans so there's this kind of persistent myth that like consciousness does everything and that if something is happening in the human brain um it's happening because of consciousness consciousness is actually a fairly limited function um we're not entirely sure what consciousness does but we largely think it's there for conflict resolution purposes when other processes in the brain conflict Consciousness kind of comes in and kind of tips the balance or something like that. But consciousness is actually not doing most of the work of your brain. Um, I mean, you know this obviously uh, by the fact that your consciousness has no idea whatsoever how your visual cortex is actually working. You know, even though you're filled, right, with all this stuff, you have no idea what's actually going on in, in those parts of your brain. And, you know, on a sort of basic level, most of your good ideas, kind of creative ideas, usually come to you when you're not thinking consciously, when you're doing something known as mind wandering. It's just kind of part of the brain. Um, there's a default mode network, which is, is largely indicated in that. So there's this tendency we have to um, overplay consciousness. And again, get into this kind of hierarchical mode of thinking where consciousness is the summit of all thoughts. And then we're once again up to this idea of there's a good and a right way to do things. And if computers become conscious, so it's okay. So in that model of thinking, intuition is the word that our conscious brain uses for all the stuff that's going on in the kind of subconscious parts of our brain. It's not really an intuition, however. It's just a mechanical process that our brain is doing. It's not magic or mystical. It's just our consciousness way of saying, I don't know how it works. Another way of thinking about this is it's the same as what's going on in your stomach right now. Your conscious brain has no idea how your, stu how your stomach is, is, uh, is handling your lunch. It just does not know what's going on in your stomach. Does that make what's going on in your stomach an intuition? You know, um, No, it just means that it's something that is not transparent to your conscious brain. It's just another mechanical process. So when we talk about an intuition, really what we're largely talking about is a moment of speculative causal reasoning or a hypothesis, a guess. I think I have this guess that this is causing that, or I have this guess that this is going to happen. Um, that's causal reasoning. Let's not speak to like our ability to maybe see through the noise because for example if like we were constantly preoccupied with how our body was digesting we'd be like so overwhelmed by all this noise um whereas we're just kind of like focusing on the signal which i guess is where intuition comes in um yes right so that once the signal gets promoted up to our consciousness it becomes relevant whereas to your point yes if we were constantly getting billions and billions and billions of stuff our mind would just like stop it already you know um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the answer, and we just, I mean, I'm going to be honest here, so we don't really know, but I mean, the answer is an intuition is obviously something that got promoted up from our lower brain regions because those lower brain regions thought it was significant. Why they thought it was significant, what's going on in those lower brain regions. We really don't know very much about it in terms of, you know, other than just broadly, but in terms of the actual kind of day-to-day -day mechanics, that's one of the reasons why I think neuroscience is so exciting is there's just a ton going on in the brain. We just don't really know. And we know that the brain is really powerful in all these somewhat underappreciated ways, but we don't kind of know how they work. And because we don't know how they work, we don't know how to use them more effectively. Um, I mean, you know, to use the example of our stomach again, once we start to understand how the stomach worked, we can then feed ourselves better. You know, uh, if you understand how your unconscious brain works, you could probably support it better. Um, 
And you know, that's that's that kind of future. So as far as how, where computers are going in terms of that kind of a thing, one thing you could say is that almost everything a computer does is an intuition in a way, because it's all non-conscious. Um, but to the extent to which it's replicating human intuitions, um, that's not what it's doing. I mean, a computer could guess and then test a guess, but it would the way it would guess would be different from the way a human would guess. Um, a computer would guess, you know, a random number combination. Um, and then it would test that random number combination. And then if it worked or didn't work, it would try something else. Um, so it could guess, you know, in the semiotic range, um, but it couldn't guess actions in the way that humans guess. So again, it, it's, computers can do a lot of the same things that humans can do, but they just do them in these different domains. So they, they don't overlap. I think this actually ties in well with our next question. Um, so Vasha is saying there are artificial neural networks these days which do adaptive learning. So it's less data and then adapts according to the system. So do you think with this adaptive learning in place that such systems could be developed further and that they one day might match human intelligence? No, because all they can do is adapt to their own methods of learning. So, I mean, there's only certain things that computers can learn to do, as we've sort of been talking about. Like, they can become much more effective at learning the things that they can learn. And the things that they can learn are logical things. Um, they can learn, become much better at, um, you know, uh, learning anything that's semiotic or, you know, syllogism-based or what have you. Um, but a computer can never learn to tell a story. A computer can never learn to make a business plan. A computer can never learn to operate on an N of one. I mean, computers can't do any of those things. Um, that's not a knock against computers. So the thing is, is what, what has kind of happened within the AI community is they've co-opted all these terms from biology, and then they've then imported them into artificial intelligence. And then this confusing thing happens, which is that, oh, now they're doing the same thing. Um, but they're not doing the same thing. I mean, they are just rhetorically <laughs> importing words um, in. So yes. The computers are learning. I mean, machine learning is not fake. I mean, the machines are learning. They're learning something. It's just that they're learning um, how to correlate things. They're not learning how to engage in plotting or planning or these kinds of narrative things that humans can do. Um, and so it's just a completely different kind of learning. I put in the, um, at the end of the article, I don't know if anyone's had a chance to read it, but I often get this question, which is like, well, what if computers had all the knowledge in the universe? What if you what if you had a computer and you input the computer with all the knowledge in the universe? Wouldn't the computer at that point therefore be able to do everything that human brains could do? And the answer is yes, in the sense that in that system, human brains could no longer do anything that computers couldn't do. Because our advantage would have been taken from us. Our advantage would be operating. But it also means that a million problems that exist in our world now wouldn't exist in that system. And within that system, there would be no need to invent the internet or no need to invent penicillin or no need to invent Jane Austen's novels. So in that system, you would never get any of those things either. You would just get a permanent eternal state of stasis in which the computer just continually recycles its own data. So yes, in that system, you know, you could, you could, so there are all these kinds of hypothetical questions about, you know, um, but, those questions are not only, you know, somewhat pointless because we'll never get there, but they also don't allow computers to actually do what humans do. They just make what humans do irrelevant. So it's kind of solution by deletion as opposed to solution by addition, if that makes sense. It basically, instead of making computers more powerful, it just deletes humans. Um, and so, again, what I really think is that the winning strategy is to promote both of us. And so I think adaptive neural networks are great as far as they make computers smarter. Quantum computing is great so far as it allows computers to solve more complicated problems. All that is wonderful. But the moment you start being like, oh, you know, if only humans were more like computers or computers are going to be able to solve this issue of global warming or what have you, or the coronavirus. I mean, famously, as probably everyone is aware, um, machine learning algorithms were applied all over the place to, to coronavirus problems. And it was a complete disaster. I mean, it was a total unmitigated disaster. I mean, everything the computers thought was completely wrong about coronavirus it was all a mess. Meanwhile, human researchers came up with a vaccine in about 10 days, you know? Um, so this is just one of endless examples of why it is that, you know, when computers are in their domain, they are extraordinary. And, you know, when we shift them into other situations, 
it's just a non-starter. So I, that's one of the reasons I think it's good to keep the rhetoric distinct and not talk about adaptive networks and things like that if we can avoid it. I know we sort of maybe crossed that Rubicon and we're never going back. You know, we're always going to be talking about artificial neural networks and stuff like that. Maybe that's just the way that it's always going to be. Um, but it would just it would just be better, I think, for all of us if we got over this. It's essentially a marketing gimmick. It would be essentially better if we stopped with the marketing. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, so we, I think maybe we have one more question, which kind of hints at consciousness. Um, as so the question references Mark Sams, who presented last year on the hard problem of a new approach to the hard problem of consciousness. Um, and his plans to build um, an artificial consciousness based on this theory. I, I'm curious if you have any ideas um, about the hard problems of consciousness or, or any comments. Um, and you can maybe take this any direction you'd like to round out the talk. So let me just say a couple things. We are completely over obsessed with consciousness. It's just not that useful. I mean, it is useful. It does something. We're better because of it. But the idea that somehow all these problems would be solved by making machine consciousness are bizarre. All that would happen is the machine would become conscious. Um, and, and, and so the harder problem of consciousness is not how to get consciousness, but to think, why would we want more of it? Why is consciousness so extraordinarily valuable that we want more of it? I mean, humans all across the globe are conscious. It hasn't solved all our problems. Um, so I, I'm perennially baffled by this idea that somehow if we had more consciousness in the world, everything would be better. That's not, I mean, consciousness is a limited, you know, so to tell you what I think consciousness is basically doing, um, there's just a lot of times in your brain where different parts of your brain are in conflict. So, you know, your memory might be telling you to do one thing, Whereas your appetite is telling you to do another thing. You know, your appetite's like, I'm really hungry now. And your memory's like, don't you remember last time you ate the fish? It was a disaster. No, but I'm really hungry right now. No, but it was a disaster last time. And then you have this conflict going on in your brain. What happens with that conflict? Well, it has to be promoted up to consciousness so that consciousness can figure out a way to resolve it. I mean, it's, it's, I mean that, that is sort of what we think anyway, um, is at least one of the functions of consciousness. Um, but consciousness isn't itself doing a lot of processing work. Um, most of the good ideas that arrive in our consciousness come there from our subconscious and our consciousness is simply deliberating between them. So first of all, I would just say that this obsession with consciousness is really just more of the kind of mysticism that I don't think is really helpful. Um, it's just sort of like the search for God, really, in a way. It's like, oh, if we found God, wouldn't that solve all our problems? Well, certainly it probably would. But I don't think we're going to because we don't have the equipment to do it. So rather than looking to God to solve all the problems, why don't we actually do what we can do and make medicines and other things? So that's the first thing that I would say is that um, even if we solve the problem of consciousness, even if we build a, a, an artificial consciousness, I don't see that as somehow propelling us forward into a, a, a more utopian or happier state of existence. Um, yeah, because we already have humans, like you said. So now we, yeah, so again, we're trying to make the machine like the human, uh, which is the point we keep coming back to. Yeah, and it's just weird. I mean, so, I mean, the number one thing I guess I would just like to drive home is that there are 7 billion humans on this planet, and most of them do not have the opportunities that you and I have. I mean, just think about, you know, all the people across this world right now who, if they were given um, a little more support and encouragement and access to resources, think of the cool stuff they could be doing. Think about if we were able to encourage a culture in which we were less obsessed with what is right and what is wrong. And, you know, this kind of monofocus on, you know, the singularity. I mean, the term singularity itself should tell you all you need to know about the problem with this logic obsession, which is the idea that somehow we would all converge into one thing, you know? If we can just get out of that, look at biology and say, actually diversity is vital, diversity is joy, diversity is all these positive things, and start nurturing that, go to other parts of the world instead of telling them to become more European, Go to other parts of the world and be like, how could you be more like yourself? How could I empower you to be more like yourself? When people come into a classroom, instead of saying, let me tell you what books to read. Let me tell you what tests to take. If we instead say to them, you know, what are, you, what are your potentials? What are your desires? How do I activate and empower you? How do I grow you? That is what I really think is the challenge. And, and the thing is, for whatever reason, um, humans just seem to get impatient with that. You know, we have this entire society that's, oh, that just takes too long. It's inefficient. We just have to force everyone to be the same. And then that will be the answer. You know, um, it, to me, it's just, it's, 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 it's enlightenment. It's misogynist. 
It's this idea that there's like one right thing all the time. Efficiency is better, you know, so on and so forth, as opposed to the glorious inefficiency um, of nature. But that inefficiency in the long run turns out to be more efficient. Why? Because it works. Because what's efficient in the short term actually burns out the system, you know? Um, uh, you know, I mean, it's like basically if you if you if you were like, you know, what would make me really efficient if I just like double fisted Ritalin right now, they'll make me so much smarter. You know, my brain is going to be so much powerful. I've got all this Ritalin. Then I'm also going to just like kind of like, you know, just mainline some caffeine in, you know, and then you're just going to like blow out the side of your brain. And then, you're, you know, the efficiency is gone. So it's this kind of short term thinking where that we're just constantly engaging in all the time. And I would just think. Why can't we look around, accept the hard challenge of lifting up other people? When we go talk to other people, the first thing that happens is we discover they disagree with us, which is very irritating, you know, or that they want things that we don't want, which is very irritating. Well, what if we just let that go and we have empathy and curiosity for them? And what if we encourage them to go the wrong way and support them, even if we don't understand? And what if we trust that if the way they're going is a dangerous way, they'll learn that and come back around? What if we just had a little more trust and, you know, and, and, you know, we don't have the infinite trust, but just a little more and a little more curiosity, more, how much more can we get there? So this isn't, again, to say that we shouldn't be investing in consciousness. We shouldn't be, it's, I mean, consciousness is useful. Having a machine that was conscious would probably be useful in some way. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with AI. There's nothing wrong with any of these things. The problem is, is that when they are um, fixated upon as utopian, um, that's the issue because in this world, there is no utopia. There is only life, <laughs> you know, uh, and life is never going to be perfect, um, which is sad, which is tragic, but also joyful because it means there's always room to grow. Great. I think that's a great note to, to end the talk on as well. Yeah. What a beautiful point. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you all yeah. for having me. Thank you for listening to me. Um, thank you for handling my skepticism with such kindness and openness and being as empathetic and curious and receptive as uh, as I could have wished. No, thank you so much. And I think just to, to close off the event, I will just um, share my screen here. There we go. Um, yeah, perfect. So yeah. To everyone in our audience, please give Angus a virtual round of applause um, just to show your appreciation for this very, very cool discussion we had. And then all of you, um, you can subscribe to Nervous mailing list and calendar. Siobhan will be sharing the links in the comments. If anyone joined us for the first time and is interested to join for our following events, you can just subscribe there. And yes, thanks to all of you for attending. And a final thank you to you as well, Angus, for taking the time and for, for having this discussion. Thanks so much. Thank you. Enjoy. Cool. Cheers, everyone.